Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our service this morning. Welcome to those of you who are with us in person, to those of you joining us online, and to those of you who will join uh, via YouTube later in the week. I think at the minute it's fine. I did wonder yesterday, my last story to the children in Town Hill was Noah. <laughs> and I did wonder whether I'd missed a message yesterday. <laughs> because it rained so horrendously. Um, but it's fine this morning, so it's, it's good to see you all. Um, there is only one additional notice. Um, you will know that Ian Glenn was to have taken part in a sponsored walk for the food bank. Um, regrettably, he is with Sue for his mum-in-law's funeral in Macclesfield and cannot take part. But the leadership team felt that the church would want an opportunity to support Ian Glenn in principle and in spirit, if not in person. So there is um, a basin at the, in the foyer for anyone who would like to put in money to, uh, to sponsor Ian, which will go through him to the food bank. There is an opportunity to sponsor online, which some of you may have done and certainly will have read. But if you wanted to put cash, um, there is a, a basket. And if we spend a minute or two to prepare for worship, please. And can I ask those of you who are able to please stand for the Bible? Thank you, Alan. It's a delight this morning to welcome the Reverend Martin Spain, who is the URC Ecumenical and Interfaith Officer. This is Martin's third visit to our church, although I think the first with this particular title. Um, so we look forward to our time together, Martin. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you. Please be seated here. And so let's hear the call to worship from the book of Colossians. Be rooted in Christ, be built in him, grow strong in the faith. Let your hearts overflow with thankfulness. So as we gather to worship our God, let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Keep with you. Heavenly Father, you are ever blessed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we gather before you now we pray that you will let the light of your love shine into our hearts that you will bless our worship that you'll transform it from its imperfection to an offering that's acceptable to you we know how the scripture sentence reminds us how we are rooted in christ we know that your son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence and so we come into your presence now. Give us pure hearts. Give us constant wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning to you all on a rather wet morning here in Swansea. The sun was out in Pembrokeshire when I left. Yes, but I suspect the rain had moved over us and was still uh, heading, heading up, up this way. Um, now, you have an event on, I understand. In, is it in Singleton Park? That's what's behind here, isn't it? Singleton Park. So you've got some event on. Now, I've parked my car in the back here. So just remember me in your prayers that when I go out, my car will still be there. Uh, because they did say, perhaps don't park here while the event is on. But I'm rather hoping it's Sunday morning and they won't be playing pop songs and doing things until a bit later in the day. So... Just remember that and remember me in your prayers, perhaps. Good to be here. We'll turn to our first hymn, hymn number 28, please, from uh, Singing the Faith. Jesus calls us here to meet him as through word and song and prayer. 
we affirm God's promised presence where his people live and care. Number 28, verses 1, 2, 3, please. Can we have our first reader come forward, please? Psalm 40. Thank you. I'm going to read the first eight verses of Psalm 40. Patiently I waited for the Lord. He bent down to me and listened to my cry. He raised me out of the miry pit, out of the mud and clay. He set my feet on rock and gave me a firm footing. On my lips he put a new song, a song of praise to our God. Many will look with awe and put their trust in the Lord. Happy is he who puts his trust in the Lord and does not look to the arrogant and treacherous. Lord my God, great things you have done. Your wonders and your purposes are for our good. None can compare with you. I would proclaim them and speak of them but they are more than I can tell. You have not desired sacrifice or offering. You have not demanded whole offerings or purifying offerings. You have given me receptive ears. Then I said, here I am, as is prescribed for me in a written scroll. God, my desire is to do your will. Your law is in my heart. Amen. Psalm 40 is all about praising God and us coming close to God. And I'll go through uh, it a little bit more in the, in the sermon later on before we lose the moment. It reminds us how God can stir up our hearts, even when we feel perhaps a little bit despondent, even when we feel sometimes we are far away from him. He's never far away from us. It's we that get very far away from him. And it's a reminder that uh, he fills us with hope and gives us an assurance that uh, what we do in his name will indeed come to a fruition and uh, that isn't done with us yet there's still work to do and i always think uh, when people um, get on a bit in life a bit older and i'm looking around perhaps some of you are in that category uh the time they say well my, my time is done well you never know god is not finished with you until he's finished with you and that's the important message that we've got there he has plans for all of us still no matter what stage of life uh, we're at so we'll turn to god now then our first portion uh, of prayers let us pray together 
Almighty and eternal God, you who are the creator of all life, you who are the energy behind this vast material universe, we come now to praise your holy name and acknowledge you with joy as King and Lord. We know that since time and space began, regardless of what we what theories we try to prove through our world of science. Since the beginning of time, we know that the whole of the created order has borne witness to your power and your glory. And ours alone, in these modern times, is the privilege of bearing witness to your love revealed to us in Jesus. Lord God, we come before you. We worship you now. We worship you with all the church in heaven and the church around the world. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor, power and might be to you, our God, forever and ever. But Father, we don't just come before you because we can claim a right to do so. You are pure holiness. You are pure love. You are pure good. And we, Lord, are self-willed creatures who cannot even live within the light you've held out to us. But Father, since in Christ you've declared your love and mercy to the world, we come now in full assurance of faith. We come to ask your pardon for our failings. We recall before you now wasted opportunities the good intentions that, that, that we haven't fulfilled. Our lack of discipline, our lack of dedication, the hurt that we may have caused, and the help that we could have given but perhaps have withheld. But we know, Father, if we come to you confessing our wrongdoings, you'll forgive us all those sins, for which we are ready to receive your forgiveness. And Spirit of God, we pray that you'll raise us up from our past weaknesses into the strength and peace of being used for your God's work in the world today. Do not leave us empty vessels, but renew in us a sense of joy and hope and expectations. For we know there are tasks as well as opportunities that lie ahead of us. Let us all have a deeper knowledge of the mind of Christ in our daily living. And may his own love inspire our thinking, inspire our speaking. May his compassion find expression in the way that we do things with our neighbors. Father God, these are portion of prayers. We ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So it's the second hymn, 158. Now there's instructions for this one, so will they come up on the, on the list? I, I sort of remember them. It's 158, and we are singing just four, by the way, omitting the last line of each verse from the hymn book. Uh, so there's a different tune obviously being chosen for this one. So 158. Lord, you sometimes speak in wonder, unmistakable and clear. Mighty signs that show your presence, overcoming doubt and fear. And we leave out the last line from every verse as it's got there. 158 then, please.
humor. We're ahead of the game. A reading from Hebrews, then, please. So this reading is from the letter to the Hebrews, and it can be found on page 1208 in the Pew Bibles. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, and verse 36. Let us come near to God. We have then, my brothers, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He opened for us a new way, a living way, through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming near. You need to be patient in order to do the will of God and receive what he promises. Thank the Lord for his good words. In the sort of middle to or towards the end of that reading, we get the words, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together, some of the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And that's what the theme of uh, uh, today's service is going to be, encouraging one another. And we'll come back to that now in a moment during the, during the sermon. And so we'll turn to God in our uh, second uh, portion uh, of prayers. Of course, I'm aware that I don't know what's going on in your life here as a church, because only, I only visit you about once a year, I think it is at the moment, isn't it? Some, something like that. Uh, and I don't know what's going on in your own life. So we'll start this time of prayer, a prayer of intercession, where perhaps you can bring your own silent prayers to God in just a brief moment of, of quiet. So let's turn to God in our time of prayer. Let us pray. Yes, Lord God, as we bring you our own prayers in a moment of silence, we thank you, we praise you for your great goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty and strength and stability of this created world, things that we so easily take for granted, things like light and color, the rhythm of the seasons, even though we may complain about the rain, we know there are parts of Europe where they're crying out for rain at this time. We thank you, Lord, for daily gifts that we have of home and food and work, the people that bring us joy, the interests and the talents you've given to the human race. And Lord, even when we find it difficult, perhaps, to find reasons to give you thanks, Above all else, we bless you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our light, our salvation, because it's from him our life can derive its meaning. It's in his 
way that we find hope and confidence and joy. We bless you, Lord, for his spirit who is with us always, even in times of doubt and suffering. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our membership and fellowship within the church, his body. And may our gratitude find true reflection always in the way that we use your gifts in Christ's name. So as we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and indeed hope, seeking your presence and guidance, hear us now as we lift up to you other people in our time of prayer. We pray that you let your light shine upon the nations of this United Kingdom and indeed the world. Father God, we pray for those in positions of authority and leadership, whether in our own communities, our county councils, the Welsh Senate, or indeed the Parliament of the United Kingdom. We are living in difficult political times. And those political difficulties, of course, impact on each and every one of us. Grant those that lead us wisdom and compassion and always a desire to serve the common good. And may they always make decisions that promote justice, equality, the well-being of all citizens. We look beyond our shores, Lord, and realize that we live in a world filled with division and conflict. There are wars that rage, of course, not too far from our own shores. There are wars that still go on in parts of the world that aren't considered newsworthy anymore. We continue to pray for unity and understanding amongst people. For if we don't pray, Lord, who will? And help us to perhaps find ways to bridge the gaps of misunderstanding. That we can always work towards peace. Peace that can start with our local actions. That can impact globally as well. May all our actions be guided by love and empathy. May our actions always be towards the peace that this world so much needs. We express our gratitude, Lord, for the dedications of frontline workers. We think of those that work in our hospitals and care homes, those that work in our health centers or surgeries, those that keep us safe on the streets, indeed keep us safe in our homes. And we know we can be very critical of people when Things aren't going right. In the main, things work. We ask that you protect and sustain all people as they continue their selfless work. Provide them with courage and strength to, to face the difficulties that, that they encounter. And importantly, Lord, we pray for your whole church on earth. Pray that it may meet the challenges of unbelief and sin with Christ's own understanding and integrity. We pray you'll inspire this fellowship here, that we can minister with vision to the community of which we are part and which surround this church. Help all of us to understand the importance of being in fellowship that we may do the work of Christ show to the world that we are part of his holy church and father God we rejoice in the great hope we have in Jesus 
and in the memory of all the faithful who've lived and worked and sacrificed to build up our heritage within the church, we give you thanks and rejoice. We think of the saints who've done great things and those who did the small things well and faithfully. We pray that our lives may be a continuation of their work, that one day, by your grace, we may be reunited with them in the fullness of the joy of heaven. Lord God, all our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom the Father and the Spirit be honor and glory forever. The same Jesus that taught us to say together that family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, it's great. Is it at this point we were taking the offering? I can't remember. Does it matter? Can we take it now? Would that be okay? There we are. We'll see your free offering. There we are. We've got the plate coming out. That's the main thing. Oh Lord God, we bring these our gifts to you, tokens of our work, our time, and our loyalty. We ask that your blessing will be upon them and upon our lives. May we be continually led to see how we may serve you more effectively through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good, thank you. So we'll turn to our next hymn then, which is 526, I think. Am I right? 526. 526. And I've got the wrong page here. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no cares could destroy. Be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. 526 then, please. <laughs>
So it's worth repeating what we heard earlier. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. There's an old story about years ago in a church meeting. There's a faithful old, well, deacon, I would say, in my, in my uh, church tradition, but elder, perhaps, you'd use here, because deacon means something else for you, Methodists. No, but an old deacon who used to use the same old phrase in his prayers. He'd get up and pray quite comfortably, quite happily in front of people, but he would say then, Lord, touch the unsaved with your finger, with thy finger. He'd use the old-fashioned word there. Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. We're all about that, aren't we? About touching the unsaved, bringing the good news to those who have yet to hear it. Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. And the story was that one evening he was praying in a, in a prayer meeting, and he repeated that phrase again and again, as he often did, touch the unsaved with thy finger. And all of a sudden he stopped praying, and he sat, sat down rather abruptly. And people thought that he was ill. But they carried on praying because they could see he was still there in, in the chair and he was still upright and he was still breathing. Uh, and eventually when, when the service was coming to a point where they could speak to him, somebody went forward and, and asked him, are you okay? You know, you stopped very suddenly there. Uh, we thought that you were ill or something. No, I'm not ill, he said. But you know, when I said that word, Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger, something came into my mind and someone spoke to me and it said, yeah, but you are the finger. Now then, think of that. You are the finger. You are the people that bring encouragement to others. You are the people that can touch other people. You are the people that can bring good news to other people. The good news that we hear in our scripture, of course, you. So as we can pray, Lord, do this, Lord, do that, guess how those actions manifest themselves? Through you and me, of course, I'll include me in that through you we are the ones that do christ's work in this world today we are the ones that are we used to sing a song and it's a sunday school about us being christ's hands and feet and ears and mouth and and, and and eyes i can't remember how it went now we had some actions that went with it but it was a, a song that reminded us that we are the ones that are the body of christ the physical body of christ in the world today we are his church we are meant to do these things we do God's work in the world. In today's world, it's a bit easier perhaps for us to connect with others. We connected in many ways. We connected today over, is it Zoom if it was here? Zoom, we connected today over the Zoom. <clears throat> and you'll be connected, well, for years to come probably, uh, this service through your YouTube channel and the bits and pieces that you put on there. I'm told I get extra, extra for every hit you get on, on the YouTube channel. Is that right? <laughs> no, that's wrong. Okay, there we are. There. I can live in hope, I suppose. But we are connected, aren't we? Anybody got a mobile phone on them? Anybody dare to bring it into church? And Yeah, I always bring mine in because it's always on silence. A minister's phone is always on silence. Yes, I've learned through, through experience. So if you phone me, it'll either buzz in my pocket very quietly or you have to leave a message and, I, and, I'll, uh, and I'll get back to you. But we're connected, aren't we? Mobile phones, email, Facebook, Twitter, all these things that I don't understand as well. What did Gordon Brown once call it? The interweb? I quite like that term, yes. The interweb. But you know, no matter how connected we are technically, it does seem in this world that we are getting less and less connected personally. And there's something we need to guard against there as Christians, as the church of Jesus Christ, because not that, that's not what God intended. These things are good, but they're not as good as being in fellowship has been in proper fellowship, i.e. meeting each other, whether it's in our churches, in our church meetings, in our activities that we do, the side activities that we do, meet together as a fellowship. Fellowship is an important word. It's a biblical term, isn't it, fellowship, to be in fellowship. But sometimes experiencing that fellowship is hard work. Have you found that out sometimes? Experiencing that fellowship is hard work. But it's important for us to stick with it because life has a way of wearing us down sometimes. How we can get discouraged. 
When we discourage, there'll be times when our spirits get broken, of course. There'll be times when our strength is gone. And you know, once in a while, when I've met with people, perhaps, when I've uh, uh, given them some pastoral counseling, and it has happened many times in, in, in my ministry, I'm always, I always think how well how fortunate I am. I'm not going through that in my life at the moment. What people are going through. People are being crushed by what life is doing to them. Maybe their finances are in a mess. Maybe they're worried about their job or their health or their children. Maybe their marriages are falling apart. So life has a way of getting at us, doesn't it? Of wearing us down sometimes. And when we get discouraged, when we get into that sort of rut, and then somebody comes to help us, what usually happens? Well, we can complain, we can feel sorry for ourselves. We may even turn a bit bitter and isolate ourselves. Sometimes we get so discouraged that we stop going to church. And we think, well, God hasn't been in my life for long now, so for such a long time now, what's the point of going to church to try to meet him there? I made the point earlier, didn't I? God hasn't left us. It's us that have left God. And that's sad when we do that, because that's when we need each other the most. That's when we need to listen to the words of the writer of Hebrews. We think it was St. Paul. Uh, in Bible commentaries today, they always say modern-day scholars, or whatever they are, I don't know. Modern-day scholars think it could be somebody else. But uh, in the Bible I got at home, it actually says uh, Hebrews written by Paul, but that, that's, that's another matter. But we need to understand what it means to encourage each other. We need to be concerned about each other and encourage each other. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, do you remember it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You probably can't do that very well over Zoom. You can have a go, but you probably can't do it very well. That's the, that's the emphasis I put on that. And a lot of people perhaps don't always understand what Christianity is is all about. Christianity isn't just about what we go through in our Bible. Christianity isn't just what we uh, hear uh, preached from, from our pulpits or the way we live our lives. Christianity is about relationships. The relationship we have with God and importantly the relationship we have with each other. It's not about rules. It's not about knowledge. It's not about being clever in church matters or church doctrine. You don't have to understand the Methodist Connectional rule book to, to be a good Christian. You don't have to learn every word of the URC manual, because they call it a manual in the URC, to learn things. And me, I'm a congregationalist. We've got nothing written down, so we make it up as we go along anyway. <laughs> but we don't have to understand any of that and have a grasp of what our forebearers have done. It's being relational. And that's how we get through what God wants of us in, in this world. It's about loving, lasting relationships. It's about fellowship. It's about us considering how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. I'll come back to that point in a moment. I'm sure you've heard of William Wilberforce. Sometimes when you say names out, out of the blue, you've got to give a context. William Wilberforce, of course, as a reminder, was the one who uh, tried so hard and eventually succeeded in getting a parliament uh, to abolish slavery uh, in, in, in Britain and the United Kingdom and, of course, our, our colonies or realms as, as they were known at the time. But he had to persevere in his efforts for that. Twice his bill was defeated in parliament. And the story is that discouraged, he was about to give up after that second defeat in Parliament. Then his old friend heard of his discouragement. Now, I'm sure you know this name. His old friend was John Wesley. Did you know that now, that they were friends? John Wesley. And Wesley at this time was on his sickbed. It turned out to be his deathbed, actually. He was on his deathbed. But he pulled himself up and asked for pen and paper and wrote to Wilberforce. And he wrote these words, and if you go to the Wesley Museum, wherever it is these days, because it moves about sometimes, isn't it? I'm not sure where it is now. Is it in Yorkshire? I'm not sure. There's, there's a Wesley Museum you can go to anyway. Uh, City, Road. City Road. City Road in? 
London, okay, it's in London. I, I worked for a while in Harrogate, you see, and there was a Wesley Museum in Harrogate, so I was wondering then what, what's happened there. Maybe it was just their own version, because of course it's connections to, uh, to Yorkshire. But Wesley wrote these words, you can see the letter there. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you'll be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Be not weary of doing well. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. Signed, John Wesley. Wesley died six days after writing that letter. It was in March 1791. And Wilberforce, with renewed education, continued on. And it was many decades later, through his uh, perseverance, that the vote once again came to Parliament and it finally abolished slavery in Britain. Uh, Wilberforce, of course, we know died within a few days of that being uh, declared in Parliament. What if John Wesley hadn't taken the trouble to encourage him? Just a net letter, just a note. What if John Wesley hadn't done that? I wonder how long it would have taken for slavery to be abolished because Wilberforce was about to give up. History tells us he was about to give up. He'd had enough. It wasn't good to work. Encouragement is important then because there's so much at stake. Paul is telling us and reminds us of the promise of Jesus that all these things should be done all the more as you see the day approaching. Because we know that Christ is coming back. Whether you believe that or not is another matter, but we know Christ is coming back according to Scripture. So we must be ready for that moment as well. So how do we encourage each other more effectively? Our meeting together is a source of encouragement. Don't give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If you see, if you study what the Bible says about meeting together, about fellowship, about the church, there are some things that church doesn't do well at a distance. So you can turn on your television channel. Anybody got Sky here still? I had 600 channels on Sky once, and I didn't watch any of them, so I got rid of Sky, yes? Because I still just went to one, two, three, and four, and sometimes five. Uh, that's on the first few, uh, few buttons there. But you can turn on your television today and turn into the God channels. Have you seen the God slots? Yes? Whatever channel they're on, they're, they're on all, all, all the freeview and free sat, whatever you got there. They're usually American preachers and even uh, evangelical preachers. You can listen in to them. You can hear some inspiring worship services. You can watch and sing along to songs of praise this afternoon. Is it on this afternoon? There's no sports on today, is there? It usually gets kicked off if there's a, a football match or tennis on. And if all, if that all church is for, then we could just sit at home and watch television, couldn't we? If that all church is for. But church is about much more. God has given his people a task that goes far beyond preaching and music, as important as they are. He's called us to be a family, a community, a fellowship. He's called us to come to know and to love each other. Love one another. Serve one another. Forgive one another. Encourage one another. And you won't do that by watching television at home. It'll help you perhaps sometimes, but you've got to come to church and be part of a fellowship to experience that in its fullness. And I think sometimes the only way we can effectively encourage each other is by committing ourselves to being part of a church family, however you imagine that to be. Not just for the sermons or the music, but to live in relationship with each other. In the Greek writing uh, 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 of the Bible, there's a word called koinonia. Have you heard that word? Koinonia. I know there's some very clever people amongst you, and I've seen some nods that you've heard it before. Koinonia means Christian fellowship. It actually goes beyond Christian fellowship. It says to be in communion. Be in communion with God and with your fellow Christian. That's much more than just normal fellowship and friendship, isn't it? That's to be in communion with each other, to understand each other, to move forward together in communion. 
And we also need to consider how we express that encouragement. And I mentioned this earlier. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us consider. That takes some thought then, doesn't it? Not something that comes naturally all the time to each and every one of us. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. So the way you encourage one person might not be effective with another person. You've got to know people. And you know them through being in fellowship with them, of course. There's another Greek word which I picked up. I shouldn't have picked up the Greek translation, you see, when I was doing this sermon. And there's a couple of words that, that, that jumped out at me. Koinonia being one. And the other one is parakaleo. Because that's the translation for encourage in the Greek. The Greek's an interesting language, a bit like Welsh. You can have double meanings to, to a lot, of the, a lot of, the, of the words. So to encourage in uh, the Greek language is to offer this parakaleo. And when the Bible talks about encouragement, and when parakaleo defines encouragement, it usually means a little bit more than just saying, oh, there we are, you're doing very well. It actually means challenging them. It actually means teaching them, rebuking them sometimes, strengthen them, push them to act in a certain way. People who encourage others say with love what a person needs to hear sometimes, not necessarily what they want to hear. And there's a difference there, isn't there? There's a difference. Parakaleo actually means to irritate or incite encouragement. Oh, I like that term. A bit of poking and a bit of prodding, yes? A bit of poking and a bit of prodding incite encouragement and you know i think we all need a bit of prodding and poking now and again don't we just now and again not every day we have too much of it i think we all need it now and again because if it were left to us we'd quite happily remain in our own churches and chapels and doing what we've always done oh yes we justify our decision to stay put by saying we are spurring one another on in our own fellowships but that doesn't show wider communion with our fellow christians isn't it koinonia Yes, we need to poke and prod each other. To be more than, as a friend of mine, a good minister friend of mine says, more than local peer warmers. You don't have peers here. No, you don't have peers here. You need to be more than local peer warmers. You know what I mean by that, don't you? In a positive way, we are to incite each other on to acts of love and good deeds. And sometimes that takes some effort to do. And that's the point of this sermon, I suppose. We've got to prepare ourselves for it. And consider how we might do that. We're not immune from what's happening in the world, of course, as Christians. And we do live in this very fast-changing world. And the older you get, the faster it seems to change, isn't it? Many of us are experiencing things in our churches which we thought we'd never see in our lifetime. My work involves going around Wales, and I go abroad, I go to England sometimes. Uh, to look and help churches that are part of ecumenical arrangements, partnerships, or areas of ecumenical cooperation. And uh, I see firsthand how COVID, as an example, has had a huge impact on our churches. Churches have still, some churches have yet to open after COVID, and they won't open. They won't open. They won't open again. There'll be a different way of doing things. We're seeing across all denominations a reduction in our membership base. You're the faithful. Grateful that you're here. You're the faithful. But where are the others? Where are the ones that fell away and haven't come back? Where are the ones that perhaps would have an interest, but because of what we got up to in COVID and we have to stop doing things, they now don't think that it's worth coming uh, to, to have a look at us again. And I know some who get despondent in small fellowships. I'm from a rural area, so I've always been used to small fellowships. But we can get despondent sometimes, even in bigger fellowships, if we think things aren't working out as we imagine them to be. But the encouragement here is, of course, that that's been recognized somewhere in the past. And we should not give up meeting together, as some in the habit of doing. Our scripture is telling us today, and maybe we need to look at different ways of being together, different ways of being church, I don't know. What we need to do is consider the way that God wants us to be in this modern world. We need to commit to encouragement. Commit to encourage. And indeed, that may be 
something is very difficult for us to do at all times. You can't always be positive in every situation, can you? And I'll finish with this story because my, my sermon will go on too long for you otherwise. There's a story about, um, have you ever had a choir here? It's part of the worshiping. Yes, some of you remember the choir? No doubt when you were peus, they were sat probably in, in one side or whatever. That, that's quite common when you have church choirs. Not many churches have them. They still do have them. I, I still go around some churches where the choir sings at the beginning and maybe do something uh, during the middle. But there was a, uh, a lady that attended a church where they had a choir. And just to be honest about it, the choir wasn't particularly good. Never had been. Never had been particularly good. But they were full of enthusiasm, and that's always to be encouraged, isn't it? Enthusiasm in any form is to be uh, encouraged. And indeed, uh, uh, when it came to the choir, this old lady, who was always full of positive comments for absolutely everything, found it very difficult to, to say anything positive about the choir. And finally, she thought of a way to solve that problem. And one particular Sunday morning when the congregation was sat waiting for the service to start and the choir filed in and took their place in uh, the choir stalls or the choir pews, wherever they were sitting, the lady leaned over and said to her friend, aren't they walking in very smart this morning? <laughs> There's always something positive you can say. And that's the message there. There's always something you can say that will be of encouragement to somebody else. And the reason we need to encourage every day is simple. If we don't make it a regular habit, we'll only do it when we feel like it. But we must be ready to God, do God's will at all times, of course. It may mean changing the way we are. It may mean doing more of the same. But we must do it in the way the writer of Hebrew suggests. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. May we, together, as people of the kingdom, spur each other on. Encourage each other, not just today, but every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I, can, I, I was going to ask where your clock was, but I've seen it there now. We're on time. That's not bad then, is it? Yes, we're on time. We're on time. Uh, our concluding hymn then, please, is 563. That's the one. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Lord, be forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if you are by my side. No wonder from the pathway if you will be my guide. 563, please. <laughs>
Loving God, as we offer a sacrifice of worship and prayers with hopeful hearts, trusting in your boundless love and mercy, may all our actions align with your divine will as we work hard to encourage each other. And may your presence be felt in the lives of all those whom we've prayed for today. In your holy name, amen. And shall we bless each other with the grace. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.